In a moment, we're going to be in God's Word, and so we want to make sure as we are in God's Word, everyone here has a copy of God's Word in front of them that they can look at. So some men are going to be coming forward to hand out Bibles. Go ahead and just raise your hand if you don't have one, and they'd be happy to place that Bible in your hands. As those are being distributed, for those that already have a copy of God's Word, please go ahead and open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, we're going to be in verses, specifically in verses 23 through 28. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 23 through 28. Hebrews chapters 8 and 9 are providing contrasts between old and new covenant realities, between old and new covenant priests, priestly service, tabernacles, and sacrifices. The author of Hebrews is clearly showing the superiority of Christ, of his priesthood, of his priestly service, of the tabernacle that he entered into, and of his sacrifice. This morning in our scripture reading, we already read through this passage and the surrounding context. And this whole section is talking about the superiority of Christ, the superiority of his mediating work in the new covenant, and the superiority of his sacrifice in particular. Please follow along as I read Hebrews chapter 9, verses 23 through 28. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter holy places made with hands, mere copies of the true ones, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy places year after year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. In our passage, the author of Hebrews is drawing our attention specifically to the superiority of Christ's sacrifice. The immediate context in verses 19 through 22 describe the bloody sacrifices required under the Old Covenant. And in verse 23, our passage says that the heavenly tabernacle had better sacrifices than these, superior sacrifices than these. Let's continue looking at verses 24 through 26. For Christ did not enter holy places made with hands, mere copies of the true ones, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy places year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he, Christ, would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. Under the old covenant, the priest would sacrifice animals regularly for the people and then specifically once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest entered the earthly tabernacle to offer the blood of animal sacrifices. And this he did year after year after year until he died and another high priest was appointed. And then he continued to do that year after year. He offered the sacrifice over and over. But now, go ahead and look at the end of verse 26. But now, once at the consummation of the ages. Th this phrase, consummation of the ages, or end of the ages, simply means the last days. The Jewish people understood that the last days is when Messiah would come. And he came. But Christ, when he came, he entered into his heavenly tabernacle. And we have been living in the last days for the last 2,000 years. Let's continue in verse 26. Again, as we continue in verse 26, this is contrasting the old covenant priest offerings over and over and over. 
but now once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, once, one time at the end of the ages, Christ appeared. He came to remove the guilt of sin. And how did he do this? Verse 26 says, he did this by the sacrifice of himself. Not with the blood of animals. He did this with the sacrifice of himself. 2,000 years ago at Calvary, Christ, the truly unblemished, innocent Lamb of God, removed the guilt of sin for all those that would trust and believe in him. He did this when he offered up himself as the superior and perfect sacrifice. When he allowed himself to be crucified unto death on a Roman cross. He bore the penalty for sin that we all deserve. And that's what we get to proclaim and remember here during this time of communion. We do this with two symbols. We do this with a cracker that represents the body that Christ the body that Christ had when he went to the cross. And we do this with a cup, a cup of juice, to remember the blood that was shed unto death. And the author of Hebrews has something else to communicate about the superiority of Christ's sacrifice. It was accepted by God. Christ lives and he's coming back. Look at verse 27. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. This verse, simply, this verse is simply stating the reality, should the Lord tarry, that every single person in this room has an appointment with death. That will be a one-time event. No purgatory, no second chances. We die and after that comes judgment. You will enter into the courtroom of God. The big question is, are you gonna be standing on your own? Or will you have a mediator to intercede for you on your behalf? Look at the rest of verse 28. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, man dies once, Christ was offered once, Christ's one-time sacrificial offering completely bears the sins of everyone? No, it says of many. His offering is not applicable to everyone universally. It's not applicable to everyone who attends church. It's not applicable to everyone who reads and knows their Bible. Look at the end of verse 28. So Christ will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. Christ lives he entered into the true tabernacle, heaven, and his offering of himself was accepted by his father. And he's coming back. He's coming back for salvation. He's coming back without reference to sin, not to bear sin again, not to atone for sin again. He's coming back to save. Who's he going to save? The end of verse 28 tells us he's going to save those that eagerly await him. He's going to save those that are looking for and eagerly anticipate his return. So the question is, do you eagerly anticipate the return of our Lord Jesus? In a moment, we're going to take that cracker and that juice that I referenced earlier. We're going to take that and celebrate and proclaim and remember during this time of the Lord's table. However, this is just a time for believers for those that follow Christ and eagerly await his return. And if you would, by your own admission, say that this does not describe you, then when, those, when that tray with those things come by, just please let the elements pass. But please do not let this moment pass you by. You will die. And after that comes judgment. And right now, you don't have a mediator. And whether you acknowledge it or not, you desperately need one. Please come talk to me, talk to any one of the other pastors of what it means to have saving faith in Christ. Believer, 
we get to look back at what Christ accomplished on the cross. We get to look back at his sacrifice, his body and his blood. And we get to look forward, eagerly anticipating his return. Believer, as your hearts are prepared, please take communion on your own.